The Le Mans 24 hour endurance race has become a motor racing institution. For the past 80 years, since its inaugural running in 1923, cars have raced throughout the night around the unique circuit that is Le Mans. It's a race that demands everything. Speed and endurance, technology, talent, teamwork and trust. And at the end of the day, probably a little bit of luck as well. It's a marathon of a race, covering up to 5,000 kilometers at speeds in excess of 220 miles per hour. It is the equivalent of a whole Grand Prix season in one race. And yet the winning margin has sometimes been as little as 20 meters. It is 24 hours of unrelenting pressure for the drivers, the team, and the car. This is not your average day. The original idea for the race came from two men. Uh, Charles Farou, who was a journalist, um, very committed to motorsport, very interested in motorsport, and Georges Durand, who was the general secretary of the Automobile Club de la West, which is still the club that organizes the race now. The ACO were always interested in promoting motoring. They were always interested in improving roads. And Farou suggested uh, the race. Uh, they, the two of them, took the idea of the race to a commercial sponsor. The reasons for doing the race were to prove things like headlights and uh, weather equipment. The roads were, were really very basic, um, and when the weather turned bad, the roads turned worse, and uh, people did fall off them. Le Mans started with what you might think of as quirky rules. The cars were classified by engine capacity. The smaller cars uh, had to have two seats. The larger ones had to have four. All the cars had to have two drivers, but only one person in the car at, this, at, at one time. But when um, a car had four seats, it had to carry three bags of ballast to represent um, the passengers who weren't there. You had to stop soon after the start and put the hood up to show that you could. There was always the most famous thing about Le Mans that many people still associate with it was the running start, where drivers ran across the track. Um, jumped in the car, started it and raced away. Right from the beginning, the cars were, were doing quite considerable speeds. 80 miles an hour was, uh, was fairly normal on the, uh, on the straights, and this is in cars which only had front wheel brakes. So it was exciting to watch, and probably more exciting to be, uh, to be driving. I think it would be fair to say that what really made Le Mans a success right from the beginning was probably the fact that Bentley went there from the very start. And it was a privately entered Bentley because Bentley himself didn't have any interest in the race. But that car did well. And in 1924, the same car went back, Duff and Clement, uh, and they won. And that turned Le Mans from just a, a French motor race into a motor race that the English knew about. It was near enough to home for them to go and watch it. Uh, the Bentley boys already had a, a boy's own paper image about them, and it became an exciting race for, for Brits to go to. And through the 1950s, Jaguar did exactly what Bentley had done in the 1920s and into the 1930s. They became the team to beat. 2003 is obviously very special for Le Mans, the 80th anniversary of the first race. But what's great about it from the philosophy of the racers' point of view is it is sort of doing exactly the same things it always did. It's just a very unique event with a very special atmosphere. It does still have a relevance to cars on the road and more than ever it's a race. Since 2000, the race has been dominated by the Audi R8s. But this year, Audi Germany have decided not to race. 
Instead, they have allowed customer teams to buy and run the cars. At the beginning of 2003, Audi UK seized the opportunity to enter this legendary contest and elected to run one of the R8s as their own. It is a raw and bitingly cold morning at Snetterton Racetrack in early February. It is the first time the team and the drivers have had a chance to see the car and each other. It's a long way to the start line at Le Mans in June, but this is a crucial first step. This is not a sport about individuals, and it's imperative that everyone clicks as a cohesive unit. Funny thing is, but with it, you, you can use actually a lot higher gear than you think. Yeah, he's got but so much torque. Some corners you think, okay, this is second gear corner, but you can yeah. exit yeah. third or fourth because yeah. it has to talk. It's a lot different to what you've been used to. Yeah. The car is nice, very nice to drive, and uh, I'm surprised how easy it is actually. It's, uh, it's much more relaxed than uh, Formula One. Formula One is also a big team effort, but uh, in the end of the day, it's the only one driver who drives the car. and. Uh, just a couple of quick, quick, quick pit stops and that's it. But here you depend on other drivers also. That's a little bit more sensitive at the rear. Than, but the engine's way better. The engine's fantastic. This direct injection stuff is fantastic. <laughs> A bit of a glow and a bit of a buzz about everybody, you know, we, we know we can do this, we just have to get it right at every stage, but, you know, we're looking forward to a great fight. They're quite tricky conditions today, so it's, it's not ideal to get a, a perfect feel for the car, but uh, fantastic gear change uh, with the paddle shift, and really the car has no ill vices, so... Um, very pleased with the first run. The drivers, I think, complement one another very well. Uh, Mika is just a one-off. He's got this lovely sense of humour. Perry's Perry. He's just a laugh a minute. And Johnny, they all go together very well. They're a good group of people. And more importantly, they're a team of people. They're all sharing information and sharing ideas, and there's no room for ego in the team. The car is fantastic. It's, it's very difficult to pinpoint a better car. It's reliable, it's fast. I can't really think of a fault of the car. It's that good. Yeah, well, I shouldn't say it, but it's really easy to work on. But it makes, it makes our job nicer. It's just done properly. Everything's been thought about, and it's just a great car to work on. There's sensors all over the vehicle that give us everything, um, you know, from um, the, the aerodynamic loads of the car to the tyre pressure sensors to fuel consumption, which is the, the most crucial um, point of all on the lap time. So we're trying to balance our fuel consumption with the view that hopefully we can avoid a pit stop, which is going to gain us time. The car is packed up and put on the truck. <laughs> the next time the entire crew will meet up again will be at Sebring in Florida for the 12-hour endurance race. It's a long way to go, America, to go and race a car. You want to do well. It's not just like a job that um, you would really sort of, nine to five job where you go to work, come home, switch off. Because even when you go home, you're constantly thinking about, um, is, is this right, is that right, have I done the job properly there? The best way to get people and the team used to the car and working with each other is in a race environment. So the, the most effective way is to do a race and to go to Sebring in March, 12-hour race, plenty of time for people to get used to how to run a team in a competitive environment. Sebring is America's oldest and most famous racetrack. Nestled in the middle of Florida, each March it hosts a 12-hour endurance race that attracts some of the finest race teams in the world. It is part of the American Le Mans series, and it's fiercely competitive. The truck uh, landed in New York. The boat was two days late. Um, and they drove down in 28 hours from New York to here and got set up, and once the truck arrives here, it's like going to Snetterson or Silverstone, it's just a different country. Although it was set up before we came here, you know, you have to go through things and recheck things all the time. We were a bit lost with our setup in the uh, beginning with uh, Monday and Tuesday, we were totally lost, and now we're getting back to where we should be. The track itself is very bumpy, and that's really what we've been working on the whole time we've been here, trying to get a car that's comfortable on the bumps that, you know, won't do anything we're not expecting. 
traffic is a huge problem here. It's, uh, it's un unbelievable. You have uh, 60 cars on the circuit, and it's nearly 20 seconds time difference from first to last. So you run into them all the time. I think that we've already seen who's going to be our chief competitors. We expected Bentley to be quick. The other two Audis out here, the, the Joost Audi and also the Champion Audi, and then the uh, Dyson car of um, James Weaver, Butch Leitzinger and Andy Wallace. That's been showing very well in a separate category, the 675 category. We had just decided that Johnny will qualify the car because uh, I did only five laps this morning and uh, Johnny did all the setup work, so he's got more confidence in the car today, so he should do it. It's a short session in qualifying, 25 minutes. You know, there's a possibility of red flags, so, you know, that, that could get cut down to 15 minutes, which really is, you know, six or seven laps. So that's the pressure point, really. Two cars point two ahead of you on fourth and fifth. Did you get traffic? Yeah. Yeah. A bit too much understeer. Yeah. Smidge too much really for qualifying. Yeah. But okay. And probably really for the race as well. Yeah. Could do with dialing a little bit of a night. I'm only two tenths behind the man Willie Pirro, uh, who's won Le Mans three times, done thousands and thousands of miles in the ID, so I'm quite pleased with that. He's just trying to qualify against people like Pirro, who have qualified this car for the last four years continuously. To be three tenths of a second off, he's done a fantastic job. It's only six. But, whereas we started the week nearly two seconds behind the quick cars, we're now 0.3 of a second behind them, so they've kind of stood still and we, we've gradually caught up. As night falls, news comes through that the two Bentleys have failed their post-qualifying scrutineering because of a technical infringement. They will start from the back of the grid leaving the UK car fourth behind the other two Audis and James Weaver in the Dyson MG. Just getting ready for night practice. All drivers have got to run for three laps, an out lap, a time lap, and an in lap. We have to make sure simple things work, like the headlights are aligned and in the right direction so we can see the track OK. And the car will be slightly different tonight because the ambient temperature and the track temperature are down from where they were before, so it's good to know how it's going to react so we can preempt that with our settings and what we expect. So, as long as I don't smash it up, of course. Hey, right. I, I, I thought it's dark. Yeah, well, it's is quite, it's quite good is it like this all the way around? Or? No, oh, only okay. along the pit straight. Out the back, it's much lighter. <laughs> this is the moment I've been waiting for. Drive in the dark. It's fun. During the race, we're allowed to change gearbox. Uh, if the driver's got a problem with the gear ratio or anything, maybe with the upright, or anything, we're allowed to change the complete back end. So obviously, to save as much time as possible, we've got to practice these things. So that was the first time we practiced it. With six minutes, we need to get down to four and a half. You have to do it really while it's hot just come in because it's not the same cold. We've got one under our belt, so at least we know where we all are. Competition between the teams is fierce. While the end day might be little on in June, for the moment, everyone is focused on winning here. This is, of course, the first time that Bentley has raced in the US for 81 years, and only the second time that Bentley has ever raced in the US. Everybody expected the Audis to be quick and they are. Everybody expected the Bentleys to be quick, but not as quick as they are. Here, they didn't really expect the car to work so well because it has to deal with bumps. It's just better than they expected it to be. Basic differences between our car and the R8. 
The R8 runs wider rear tyres, two inches wider, so a little bit more grip. We have a slightly larger restrictor, so we have a little bit more power. We have obviously a different body shape, theoretically more efficient. I think we will be the quickest car in a straight line. I think our car is reliable. Uh, we should have a good race uh, pace and we would like to make uh, life as hard as possible for the Bentley. We're racing the same cars and uh, if we can't win, we'd rather one of the Audis win. We're about half a second off the factory Audi and for a small private team to get that close to the big boys, I think really justifies the decision to get this car. I think there'll be 150,000 people here this weekend, and they reckon at least three of them will be sober. Just before the final practice session, a fierce tropical storm blows in. It's too dangerous to drive, so the team practice driver changes undercover instead. We've had to come back in, obviously the weather's been quite bad and you know, we've missed a session tonight. Drivers are just going through practice again, getting in and out. They've got in the region of about 45 seconds while we fuel and then change tyres. So it's very important they don't overrun our time. Every driver's got little um, idiosyncrasies of how they want the belts, how they don't want the belts. Obviously the seats and the sizes of the drivers are different, so uh, they've got to know what the other guy wants. Let's, let's, so, yeah, the brakes are bad. We're on, we're on 37 seconds at the moment. Let's concentrate on getting this down. Once we're comfortable with that, then let's see if we can talk. Good morning and welcome to Sebring. This is John Heindorf and the American Le Mans Series radio web crew around the world at www.americanlemans.com. Frankie. <laughs> yeah, sure. Your parents are watching. And then <laughs> the hairpin I let you pass. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're a lovely no, take fella. care. Good luck. Yeah, you too. Take care. Good luck. Good luck, Frank. Good luck. Have fun, mate. See you later. later. Yeah. I think everything feels fine, so full attack. Mika's job first, so uh, I can relax for a couple of hours, and then uh, it's my turn. Seabring is something special, and 12 hours are very long, so I'm a bit nervous. are up to 19th and 20th respectively. Samo has dropped back a little. Yeah, I think Piro right now actually looks like he's making a little bit of a chart to come up and close up on Piro. very tough race and as Johnny takes over in the car he is immediately challenged by the number eight Bentley. Bounce off, he would have gone straight on anyway, so 
Unfortunately, it put us off too and cost us a little bit of time. There is Perry McCarthy making his way around, shown in fourth place behind Marco Werner, Stefan Johansson, and Mark Blundell. That's Perry McCarthy, Perry he's in trouble. Yeah. Well, Perry's in, they've got something going on over on the right side of the engine bay there. It's like a little tube that obviously maybe pitched, maybe a sensor line or something. I'm not sure exactly what that was, but then he's back underway. So just a minor glitch there, probably cost him about a minute overall on track position. We lost boost control on the turbo, so we had to come in. We've got a fail-safe system, so we had to swap it over to that. After five hours of racing, the UK car loses position to the number seven Bentley. But Mika refuses to give up and pursues Tom Christensen to try and regain fourth position. Oh, Look boy. at this. Nope. Salo is all over the back of Christensen. Man, no wonder he's watching. Look at Salo. Well, it is wonderful to have drivers the caliber of Mika Salo in this race. As Mika finishes his second stint, there are problems with the clutch, and Johnny struggles to restart the car. Johnny Kane cannot get the car to fire up. It's fired up once, it's died, it's fired up a second time, it's died. And I see the problem is he can't get it into gear, he's the engine, and he just won't go. Sorry, the big gearbox change. Couldn't disengage the, the drive from the engine to the gearbox. So we have to change the back end. There's still well, four cars in front of us. Probably five, five in about uh, another five or six laps. Um, and either one of those could maybe suffer from the same problem as well. So, you know, it's worthwhile trying to fix. The team have managed to change the gearbox in a mere four and a half minutes. But it costs them 20 minutes in track time and fifth position. The race itself continues at an unrelenting pace. The R8s of the Yost team and the champion team are running within a few seconds of each other, closely pursued by the Bentleys. It's going to be another victory for the Yost team. After 12 hours of racing at extreme speeds with intense concentration, the end comes surprisingly suddenly. The R8 of Frank Bieler, Marco Werner and Philip Peter pulls up to claim the win at Sebring. from the team make good strategy, good job from the team, good car from Audi, thank you guys, thank you. As the winners celebrate on the podium, the UK team are packing up, ready for the long journey home. It is now April, and the car is back at the factory in Littlehampton. The team are reflective about their experience in Sebring, and preparing for a further test session at Snetterton. At Sebring, Frank Bieler raced for the Yost team as part of the American Le Mans Championship. But Yost are not entered for Le Mans, leaving Frank free to join the UK team. Sadly, this means losing Johnny Kane. But having proved his worth at Sebring, he is now snapped up by Bentley to be their reserve driver. One of the difficulties we had at Sebring was that we had three good drivers, but none of them had driven an R8 before. So when they got in it, if it had a particular trait, they couldn't say, hey, that's not right. They'd say, well, is it? I don't know. How does an R8 go? We dropped Frank in the car, and within three laps, he'll say, well, you know, that's not the car I drove at Le Mans last year. Uh, can we change this? Can we change that? In a very short period of time, you'll have a car that was the car he drove at Le Mans. Then you drop the other guys in it, and they say, oh, that's how an R8 should be. The car is uh, rolling in uh, fast corners. The feeling is rolling a bit too much in the rear. So I would like to rise it maybe by one million front. OK, mate, no problem. But the speeds you do at the moment, the aerodynamics are crucial. And ideally, you want to have 
minimum downforce uh, makes the car quicker through the air, but at the same time, you've got to have the grip through the slower corners. So you've got to try and find that balance. If you can get the pace and the fuel economy well matched and get an extra lap out of the car over the course of 24 hours, it's a big, big save. Driving the car makes a big difference. Just a millimeter, it's a big difference. Uh, the car's a bit lighter on turning in in the rear, so brake turning in, uh, turning in, you might get a little oversteer. But in general, for me, the car is quite nice to drive. Compared to car I drove before in the Sebring, the gear is on this different planet. Upshift and downshift, so much quicker. It's just much more like a car now. It feels actually really nice now compared to what it was in the uh, It just didn't feel right and we had no time to fix it and uh, it felt a bit like a road car there. It was just too comfortable and, and now it feels like a different car. It's just a question of getting used to each other and uh, let's say make the other drivers comfortable in the car and I think that's what we did today. The car feels nice and um, I think we're all quite optimistic. I mean whether we are really competitive or where we are exactly we will see at the weekend. What was encouraging is that Mika in a very short run did virtually the same time as Frank and Perry was right on the pace only about 0.3 of a second behind them and he had the worst of the tyres. That was a good day. Le Mans as a circuit is completely unique. It is a huge 8.48 miles in length and is made up of long stretches of public road connected by a section of track. It is exceptionally fast, allowing cars to achieve an average speed of over 140 miles per hour. What's so great about Le Mans is the tradition of it. Coming across a start line now, it was always the start line here, except for one year. This is where all the, uh, all the first buildings at Le Mans started to grow up. This is, um, now the S is going up to the Dunlop Bridge, which not only has moved about a little bit in its time, but has changed shape used to be very tall and narrow like the tires of the day now it's a little bit flatter low, more low profile that links the the paddock side of the circuit to the fun fair coming down to Terre Rouge corner and on to uh, the start of the Mulsanne straight which is certainly the biggest challenge for the cars because they they go through such incredible mechanical stretches down here in the old days, they were uh, they were maintaining maximum speed for a long, long time. This is uh, in its heyday. I think it was six kilometres long. Now it's punctuated by chicanes to uh, to slow the cars in several places. Basically, it was getting too fast for uh, for safety. On my left-hand side, we're just coming past. Uh, the famous bar at Les Unagères. And across the other side of the road is the old Le Mans horse racing uh, track where the Wright brothers made the first flight in Europe. It is one of those places at Le Mans where the car gets so light aerodynamically they have been known to take off. It's a very, very big test of brakes coming down here, especially in the morning when you have to shed maybe 150, 160 miles an hour in, in 100 yards or so. Now you're back onto uh, another 200 mile an hour section between Mulsan Corner and Indianapolis Corner. The corners aren't geometric. Somebody didn't sit down and design this as a circuit. This was roads. This is um, Arnage, past the village of Arnage. This is where the circuit ran down to the old White House corner, famous for the number of accidents that it had there, including the huge accident in 1927 when all the Bentleys wound up in one heat and one of them escaped to win the race.
This is now going through the Porsche curves, which is the first part of the new section going back towards the start finish straight. I can't imagine what this would look like at night at racing speed. And then as you come out of the, the Porsche curves there, you get the first view of the grandstands up ahead of you. If you can do this about every three and a half minutes for 24 hours, and uh, not spend too much time in the pits. And you'll come back past this very famous clock here at four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. And you'll at least be a finisher. And you may even be a winner. It's official test weekend at Le Mans and all the major teams are here to practice. It's the only time that the circuit is available to them apart from during the race itself. Sunday is serious. The teams have eight hours on the track. It's the only opportunity they have to set up and test the car. First thing this morning, Frank will just make sure, yes, the car's good. Then we put the other two drivers in. They will do long runs, which will also give us some indication of what tyres we need to run. We have to order the tyres for the race weekend after this weekend. If you are on a normal circuit, uh, it's quite easy to find your rhythm. Uh, with a big circuit like this, uh, it needs some laps to, to get used to it again, because you have very long straight where you can relax. On the other hand, you have to keep the concentration for the next corner. The team are trying a number of different tyre compounds and constantly monitoring speed and fuel consumption. They are also keeping a close eye on the competition, the Bentleys and the other two Audi teams. The car still feels maybe a little low in the front or a bit too high in the rear. So I would like to ride it maybe by one mil in front. Okay, Frank. The car was very good, like it was at Snetterton, the balance was very similar and the only problem at the moment is there's a lot of dirt on the circuit so that's why lap times are quite slow. Uh, I'm quite sure during the session the circuit becomes better and then on the end of the session we have to go out again to, to do a quick one. Yeah, it's looks better everywhere. Traction is better. I can open the throttle earlier and also it's more comfortable through the high speed. I think I did 15 laps total and uh, it took a while to find the breaking points in the circuit and but it's, it's unbelievable circuit. It's such a great place and uh, but I, I think I think I got it quite okay now. We finished up with the the quickest Audi time of the morning. So very very satisfying, very pleasing, very encouraging. through the high G-loading corners, uh, but apart from that, no real drama. Um, if you want to jump this I would like to try the setting, the things we do with the use D, yep. and then we can run a new D and then the qualify. Okay, Frank, you got new tyres, a full tank of fuel, and we'll go and do six flying laps. circuit and as soon as he went off they came out with the oil flags. Sod's law. The rear end is completely fine. Right, 
Morocco guy, I don't know, we have to check. It was impact rear right, you know. So, so I'm okay. I mean, I don't feel uh, very nice. But uh, I, I could not do nothing. There was oil on the circuit. Uh, there was no flag before the oil. The car looks pretty bad, so... Uh, I hope when the, the guys uh, see it, it's, it's, it's not as bad as I expected it to be or expected to be. I don't know, I'm just very sorry for the guys. I mean, everything was running well and the car was good and now it's broken. The car could be repaired. Uh, it was near the end of the session, so hey, it's just one of those things. That's motorsport. We had something specific we were trying to address and it looked like from that first outlap and the part of the lap that Frank was able to do, that it was going to be positive. I think that's going to be our starting point for, um, you know, six weeks time. June the 9th, 2003. It's the Monday of race week and as preparations for the race begin, the drivers are contemplating what it means to race at Le Mans. I've been driving since I was five years old and I didn't really take it so serious. I just enjoyed it until Let's say I was something like 18, 19 when it started to get a bit more serious and I uh, was playing ice hockey same time in Finland and uh, then I really had to make a decision which when I continue racing or ice hockey because they took full year and I hopefully chose the right one. As long as I can think, I was, I was dreaming about uh, or thinking about being uh, or become a race driver. Sometimes after yeah, now 20 years of, of, of racing, you are happy being back home. But uh, let's say after, I don't know, eight weeks at home, uh, you realize that uh, this is the thing you have to do, and I still want to do it. And uh, I think this is very important. If you, if you don't have this feeling anymore, uh, I think there's no way to, to win races. The most amazing thing is, all the way through my career, I was looking to go into Formula One, and I did eventually make it. And I never paid any attention to sports car racing or Le Mans. The first year I did Le Mans, I realized how wrong I was. I just went, oh my God, I've been missing out on this. It is so special, it just makes you feel fantastic. In sports cars, you need to take make little compromises because there's three drivers in the car so you need to make a compromises with your driving seat and a uh, little bit driving position uh, some setup stuff as well I drove with Jackie X and I drove with Hanstuck and I drove with Al Holbert in the years that I won wonderful drivers but I knew whenever they got out of the car my car was the car was in perfect condition and when I handed it back to them I think they had the same confidence in me the circuit itself is fabulous because there are so many high-speed corners, so many elevation changes. The cars really are in their element. Although it's a sprint race, you're always conserving. You know, you're always thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and consistently break at the 150 meter board because I want to keep, I don't want to overdo the discs or I don't want to overheat the brakes. And so you're trying to drive to a very, a very strict rhythm. Every now and again in practice, they'll say, just go out and give it hell. And to drive around Le Mans flat out, you know, using all the revs, using everything, using all the boost is a fantastic experience. And it's something that no other track can actually offer you. The history of Le Mans is fantastic. <laughs> you know that if you can come away with this, you, you're part of that Le Mans history and you come away with something very special indeed. Sooner or later you walk through the city and you see all this uh, food and, and handprints somewhere on the, on the ground and uh, you read the names and um, it's something very special and, and, and uh, I think every driver wishes to be there as well. For sure it will be something special but it's, a, it's the biggest race in the world. The first stage of race week is the technical scrutineering, held as tradition dictates in the town centre. Le Mans turns scrutineering into a, a multifunction event. Uh, the, the first part of scrutineering, as it is anywhere in motorsport, is about safety. The second part is scrutineering for eligibility to make sure that the cars obey the rules. Le Mans has always had rules that have been slightly different from anyone else's. They've always gone their own way. It's theatre. It's like everything else here. Hello, this is Radio Le Mans. I'm John Hangdorf, and this is 91.2 Radio Le Mans with Autosport.com. It's all happening right here between now and 6 o'clock on Sunday night, and I'm delighted to see you. Our first guest, rather appropriately, really, Perry McCarthy for Audi Sport UK. 
Purry, welcome to Radio Le Mans and welcome to Le Mans 2003. John, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. What an honour to help you open the show, mate. I know. In 2002, there was more Brits here than at British Formula One Grand Prix. It was Britain's biggest motor racing event. It just happens to be in the, in the middle of France. All the teams are now in place and eager for the racing to start. We have put in every effort to build a competitive car, to get the right package from the driver point of view, the tyres, the engineers, the development and so on and so forth. It's extremely important for Bentley and, and for the group that, that Bentley succeeds this year. I think the Bentley is a better car than the Audi right now because it's the state of the art. You know, the Audi has not developed, we've developed a car for this year. The Audi's been developed for the last three years. Well, we had a lot of bad luck last year. We had, uh, we had a trouble in every hour, <laughs> almost. Uh, we're, we're glad that we finished seven. But, um, yeah, we learned a lot from last year. The UK team came to Sebring and they saw how competitive it was there. I think that's going to be a walk in the park compared to this weekend. It's going to be so intense that if any team makes the slightest mistake, it could cost you the race. Wednesday also sees the start of qualifying. It's a complicated system. There are two sessions, running from 7 till 9 p.m. and then 10 till midnight. Each driver has to complete three laps in the light and three laps in the dark. The fastest single lap is the one that counts until tomorrow when the whole process is repeated. We want to get a good qualifying lap in, we'll be in the bank so that if we had a disaster tomorrow we've got a reasonable qualifying position. Uh, get all three drivers in the car at some stage during the evening so that they've had a look at the place and get a good balance on the car. Bentley lap was Tom Christensen who uh, at the end of the lap he came in and he was talking and he was so fired up he thought it was very very nearly the perfect lap he had uh, the tires were working the car was working he said he'd never actually felt the car feel faster through corners like the Porsche curbs um, he no, had no traffic he passed one car on the circuit the UK Audi which was uh, was third was only about just over four seconds behind that, had far from a perfect lap, wasn't really going for an absolute maximum time. So that's very encouraging, I think, for them. Bila put in a very good lap last night for the UK team, did a wonderful job. So uh, now we all have to try to catch him. Someone goes out at the end of the first session and pips us, then we've got a plan B, which will then say, OK, we'll put Frank back in the car and go again and we've got so we've got another two sets of qualifiers so we'll try them if we have to.
told it's like a big accident, so it's going to take a long stop. Put him in the garage. Have a good look over it, fellas. All I want to get from Frank is that the balance is good, and then after that, we're just going to stick you in it and drop a car. Did he have a comment? I didn't know. I didn't get a, didn't get a long enough run. He only just started to run, and the red flags were out. So they've got him out of the car just now. But yeah, he's in the ambulance, and the car's gone. Yeah. The car's gone. Yeah. So go cautious. team have dropped back to fifth and there are still problems with the brakes but Mika must complete three laps to ensure his qualification how confident are you with the track now no problem we've heard of braking points and everything is fine so no problem hey, no problem because we have a stop and fix there so i think uh, we'll get you out for the time being you want to change just the cable or master I think the, the problem is with the master cylinder, let's change that. Greg, did you see to check the gap or to leave it? Leave the gap, get the tyres on, let's get him out. It's approaching 11pm. The team is still lying fifth, and to regain third position, Frank needs to find an extra two seconds. There is a single set of qualifying tyres left and they only last for one lap. Hey, here he comes, boys. He's just coming up off the way bridge. I had three runs. I had one on race rubber with some traffic. And uh, first qualifier was traffic. I was a bit angry with the others. And finally then the last one was okay. There was almost no traffic and it was a good lap and good enough to be on the third position. It was nearly dark. So how the hell he found the time, I don't know, but I'm really pleased he did because uh, we wanted to be quick as Dowdy and we are. For an elderly gentleman of my age, it's too much excitement. <laughs> okay, Perry. Just drive the car till it runs out of gas, mate. I'm out of fuel. I'm in the pit lane. Hey, Perry. At the end of qualifying, the team have settled on their race strategy. Fuel consumption is critical. If they can run for 15 laps before refueling, they will be able to put pressure on the Bentleys, who can run for only 13 laps. The team are exhausted, but they are asked to clean the fuel tank to give them what might be a crucial advantage. Tomorrow, that's, that's going to be the main aim. You guys can just clean it, and then we get home and get some sleep. As the team continues to work on the car, legions of British fans have already set up home in the campsites, and the town of Le Mans is taken over by the driver's parade. No one in the world is there anything like this. The canal try and be as good, but it'll never be as good as this race. There are lots of people like um, going out to concert hall, and they say the music is beautiful, but when we hear cars going down the most lap, it's like music to our ears. <laughs> uh, well, this is our first time at the Mon, and so far we're just having a wicked time, and yeah, we've just come to support the Audi team, really. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight is uh, garlic mushrooms, uh, and then there's a pate on a Melba toast, 
followed by an orange sorbet, char-grilled chicken with steak marinated in a garlic and wine sauce, salad and also garlic potatoes, French tart and vintage pork. Finally, it's race day, and surprisingly, it rains heavily in the morning, soaking teams and fans alike. Everyone shares in, in the endurance. The drivers, the team, personnel, the caterers, the broadcasters, and the spectators. And at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, there will be tears shed. Every car that goes across the line, there's, there's an attachment, an emotional attachment to them. But it doesn't matter if they're 40 laps down on the leader. They've got to the end. Everyone is setting themselves little goals and achieving them. I've got two things I need to do here. Miles down straight in the day, miles down straight at night. That's, that's what I'm really aiming to do. And I like sitting in the stands as well. Of course, there is uh, lots of British team. Just hope that uh, the French people will do pretty well. <laughs> but we know that the power of uh, all the British team are, is strong, so we'll see. This is what you're coming for. This is the best part of the week. You know, you forget all the, the week that's gone on before, and uh, that, that's for the fans. That, but this, this today is for the for the mechanics. We just got to wait for the start now. By the afternoon, the rain has cleared, and the tension builds steadily as the famous clock ticks round to 4 p.m. Strange silence descends on the team as they watch the first few laps. Six months of hard work, dedication, sacrifice and commitment have come down to this one single epic race. Settle slightly after the first pit stop goes smoothly. The team settle back down to wait for the second one. Has anybody noticed this number eight Bentley took driver and tyres after the second stop? Frank missed the pit lane entrance because of a slower car blocking his way. He now has just three and a half litres of fuel left to complete the lap. I'm in full sun now, and I'm still running. Very, very easy and gentle. Slow down, slow down. Shit, I will not make it. I have some cut off. Track. I'm running out of fuel. 
struggle to deal with the enormity of what has happened, the race continues. As the sun sets, the Bentleys continue their relentless progress at the head of the field. As the temperature drops, they are able to run the tyres for longer, and it offers some respite to their drivers inside the hot, covered car. The champion Audi from the States is also running smoothly. The team are hugely experienced at running the car in the American Le Mans series, but this is a much longer race than they are used to. The GO team from Japan are also running well, easily holding on to their fourth position. As midnight approaches, thousands of fans have flocked to the stage to see Jamiroquai play. The UK team join them for a while in the hope that they will be able to close out the sound of the race that is continuing without them. With metronomic regularity, the four leading cars continue to lap the circuit. Exhaustion is beginning to creep up on the teams, but they have not even reached the halfway point yet. Slowly the dawn creeps in, still the Bentleys lead, still the Audis pursue them and there are still 11 hours of racing ahead. In the cold light of day, the disappointment of the UK team's premature departure is still difficult to come to terms with. Had he made the pit lane, that would have been fine. That's two more, that's two more laps than the Bentley was doing. He was also having to be aggressive about making time on the circuit. You don't just hang back. So somebody might say he was being silly racing with the Panos when he knew he was coming into the pit lane. Every second that he could save into that pit lane was a second less out of the race. So he was doing absolutely what he had to do as a racing driver. They genuinely believed that they could take the race to the Bentleys, and all the figures say that that's probably true. They were running longer stints. They had discovered that they could run hard tyres and still be on the pace. It just didn't work. There are four hours to go, the equivalent of nearly three Grand Prix races. Everything's extreme, so of course, the emotions are extreme, as we've seen. It can go from high to low. There's no middle ground with Le Mans. Everybody's fighting, everybody's trying. The guys that are still out there now, I would say probably two-thirds of them know that they're not going to race for a position on the podium, but what they're racing about is pride. They want to be there at the end. They want to take the chequered flag at 4 o'clock, and I'll guarantee you right now, in those grandstands over there, every single car will get a huge ovation from the knowledgeable grandstands full of supporters of sports car racing. It will bring a tear to your eye, and if it doesn't, you must have a swinging brick in there instead of a heart. As the race enters its final hour, the grandstands begin to fill up again. Everyone is exhausted. Everyone is relying on the last vestiges of adrenaline and desperately concentrating to avoid making a single mistake. As the cars come over the line, the crowd and the emotions spill over.
I guess it is the world's toughest motor race. I, I don't know what's worse to finish after two hours or 22 hours. You know, a lot of cars don't finish here. It is a tough thing. Anything that goes wrong, and that's it. It's the end of it. But, you know, we have to accept that there are more disappointments in motorsport than there are successes. It's happened. It's done. What we've got to do is look forward. You know, the story isn't over yet. It's unfinished business. We'll be back.